we're talking about how that God is a healer. So we spent the first several weeks talking about how that it's God's will that you be healed and whole and that sickness and disease has no place in your life. Then we went into it and even showed legally how that healing has been provided for us in redemption. We made the statement, healing is provided in the atonement. So if you look at the 19 different individual cases of healing, now obviously there was a lot more than 19 individual cases in the ministry of Jesus. John said that the books of the world of the day could not hold all that, that he did. But the Holy Spirit saw fit to put these 19 individual cases. And, and there's, I did a teaching on all of them. Uh, you can go online and, and look at that. And we kind of really broke that down, and I'm sure we'll, we'll do that again sometime. But even in these series, as we go into healing, we're going to showcase different ones as the Lord leads us. You see every situation. You see hopeless situations, no way out, at the point of death, healed whole, set free. You see people past the point of death who died, brought back to life. I'm telling you, all things are possible to him who believes. And see, but it all starts with you got to know God's will, right? Faith begins where the will of God is known. Well, we talked about how that healing is in the atonement, and then we talked about God. If you'll notice, we've been laying a foundation of who he is. You know, there's so many believers that at the end of the day, they, they live the way they want and they do what they want and they're not living with a conscious reality of who God is in their life. And it's simply because they just don't, they, they almost live like they just don't believe God is who he says he is, right? And, and boy, I'll tell you, the more you walk with him, the more real, he's, he's, all, he's an all-consuming fire. It's wonderful. Burns off the junk in your life. I love that about him. And so, you know, for me, if you'll notice on Sunday, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, we're not going to jump right into the baptism. We got to talk about who he is so that we really understand. Because it's not, it's not knowing what you believe. It's knowing who you believe. This is why on these days, we've spent eight weeks. We're going to spend another one here on who God is. We went in to talk about how that God is a God of mercy. He always, he always shows mercy, that he's gracious, that he's disposed to show favor. He wants to bless. He's not in your life looking at you going, I'm so ticked that you're not doing the right thing. He's looking at you going, I just want to, I, I want you to invite me in so that I could move. And so many times, we don't invite him in because we're so, we're looking at our own life. We're so into all that we're going through that we miss the fact. But if we'll just get our eyes off ourselves and trust him, say, you know what? I'm going to fix my eyes on you and I'm going to trust you to fix my life. Did you get that? I'm going to fix my eyes on you, Jesus, and I'll trust you to fix my life. Because you and I can't fix our life. I mean, you could try, knock yourself out. But there's no joy in it. But there's nothing like when the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, brings transformation into your life, right? So then we went on and we've been talking about, last week we started, we're going to go on today, about how that God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He never changes. Amen? So last week, just in review, we started out with Malachi 3.6 where God says, I am the Lord, I change not, right? And, and he said, because of that, you guys aren't going to be consumed, which was really good for them because this was talking about the judgment of God. Then we went into Numbers 23, 19, and remember that? We said how the word says, God is not a man that he should lie. Titus 1, 2 says, he's the God that cannot lie. And then it says, neither is God the son of man, that he should change his mind, that he should repent. God doesn't lie and he doesn't change. Isn't that good news? So if he said, I've redeemed you, Jesus says, I personally redeemed you from sickness and disease because I was made a curse for you. 
Isn't that awesome? In Matthew 8, 17, he literally said, I, or it says, Jesus himself, quoting Isaiah, bore your sickness and carried your pain. Well, if he did, then you don't have to. If he bore it, and if you study redemption, that means it was all put on him and he bore it away. So I don't know what symptoms you have in your body, or let me get that right, I don't know what symptoms you may have in God's body that you live in, but Satan is trespassing. So if, you know, if, if in your life Satan was going to bring diabetes against you, guess what? If your blood sugar is too high, that diabetes is not yours. Jesus bore yours. And you don't, have to, you, you don't have to bear that in your body. And you could take the word of God and simply trust God. And what you can't do, he'll do. Because he's a healer. Do you get that? He's not a man that he should repent. Hath he said, shall he not do it? Hath he spoken, and shall he not bring it to pass? Right now, tonight, Jesus is seated on the right hand of God the Father. And he's watching your life and my life. And what he's looking for is he's looking for his word coming out of your heart through the vehicle of your mouth so that he can perform it in your life. Isn't that good news? See, the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Well, God said, I've provided healing for you. So therefore, you're healed. So all we have to do when we say, Father, I just believe I received my healing. I thank you that by your stripes I'm healed. Guess what? That's that two witnesses right there. And now what happens? Every word will be established. Jesus sees to that through the person of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? So we talked about that last week. What God, remember we said this, what God says is true because whatever God says is true. It's truth or it's true because God said it, right? And then we looked at Exodus 15 and we saw, this was talking about the story when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. They come to the brook of, of Marah, this water, and it was bitter. And then God had them throw a tree in and it was made sweet. This is the first time that God identifies himself to the children of Israel, and he does it. He says it in first, verse 26. After he makes, he says, I'm going to make an ordinance with you. I'm basically going to make a rule. And then verse 26 says, and here's the rule. Verse 26 of Exodus 15. And said, if you will diligently hearken, in other words, if you will hear my word and obey it, to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments. Thank God we only have one. We're to love our brothers and sisters the way God loves us. The whole law is fulfilled in that. But he says if we'll do that and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And we broke all that down last week. About it. It's in the Hebrew permissive tense. About I will put was not even in the original manuscripts. Basically, the literal translation we said last week is, none of, if you'll hear and obey my word, if you'll do my word, God says none of the diseases that have come upon the Egyptians will come upon you because I am the Lord that healeth you. And remember we said in the Hebrew in the Hebrew tense, I am the Lord that heals heals you. You cannot tell because there's tenses that they could have used in Hebrew words that have tenses and they use the words without it. So it could read I I am the Lord who did heal you, is healing you, or will always continue to heal you. There's no tense. So literally God's saying I'm just a healer. If you'll just obey my word, none of these diseases that came upon the Egyptians will come upon you. In other words, for us, none of the sicknesses and diseases in this world will come upon you because I'm the Lord that heals you. That's, what, that's the rule. 
So you might say, and we talked about this last week, well, okay, so if I get symptoms in my body, the first thing I'm going to do is check up on my life. Lord, is there any door? Did I open any door to this? Under the context of knowing, we see in Jesus' day that there were people that had sickness and disease in their body, but it wasn't because of their sin, it was just because of Adam's sin. See, our bodies are subject to sickness and disease in this earth. We have unredeemed bodies, we live in an unredeemed world. This is the most dangerous place we're ever going to live, right? Right? So, so we could be doing the right thing and it's just an attack of the enemy. Well, it doesn't matter because God's saying, I'm your healer. Now, he'll teach you how to get proactive so that that stuff cannot come upon you. See, the, we're talking about healing. Healing's wonderful if you need it, but here's where we all want to get, and this is where God wants us to get, where we're walking in divine health. So now, we, we're ahead of the ball game, Right? And, and what, how, how do we walk in this? By constantly putting his word first, living in a, a living relationship with him, allowing the Holy Spirit to reveal things and show us things to come. I mean, he might, he might see, walking with the Lord, you think all this is woo-woo spiritual stuff. But the Holy Spirit will go, hey, you need to, you need to take four times the vitamin C starting today. Because he knows he, he needs to build up your body because there's some virus out there or whatever, right? This, this, this is how it works. But he'll also tell you his medicine. And I want you to start speaking this over your life, right? So, so whatever it is, he leads us. So this rule of Exodus 15, 26, we put God's word first and act on his word and he allows no sickness in our life. This rule will never change as long as we're on the earth. Okay? So, Exodus 15, 26, the first time he identifies himself to the children of Israel, he identifies himself as, I am the Lord that healeth, healeth thee. Isn't that good news? Wow. So this is good. And then we went on. I just want to make sure I'm getting all this stuff. You know, actually, I think that's good. So now I want to, we're talking about how that God identifies himself. I want to real briefly take you through the Old Testament. God identified himself by seven redemptive names. And those names revealed things about him. So I just want to give these to you um, because this will help you know who God is. Now remember, redemption means to rescue to deliver from what? The bondage of sin and the penalty of violating God's law. See, God is life. These laws keep us safe. Disobeying these laws doesn't make God mad so he smacks you. No, the curse, the destroyer's in the earth. So, so this is what redemption is. The very word Jehovah, first of all, all of them started with Jehovah. So Jehovah, it literally means the self-existent one. That does what? That reveals himself. Who keeps covenant, who always fulfills promises, and always takes action. That's what Jehovah means. Let me say that again. The self-existent one who reveals himself. Isn't that good news? He's not holding anything from you. If you're believing God for your healing, man, if, you, if, you, if you're sitting here going, okay, I know he's a healer. I know I believe this. I've received it. Why is this not manifesting fast enough for me? Ask him. Is there anything I'm doing that's keeping me? And he'll position you right. The self-existent one who reveals himself, who keeps covenant, and who fulfills promises. He always keeps covenant. He always reveals himself. He always fulfills promises. And he always takes action. You move towards him, he's moving towards you. 
anybody messes with you, they have to go through him. The, the angel of the Lord encamps round about those that fear him. So as I live my life with a reverence and an honor and a respect above everything else in life for God, now I've positioned myself where the angels of the Lord encamp round about me. See, it's, it's sad because they're camping round about me on my path. But if I, by an act of my will, decide to leave the campground where they're camping, well, now I'm out on my own. And, you'll, and the Holy Spirit will be down there going, get back, right? He helps us all the time. So let's look at this. The seven redemptive names of God, what do they reveal to us? They reveal our redemptive rights. These are our rights as believers. It's what we've been given in salvation. God redeemed us out of something to himself. So now everything that God is, we have. The first one is Jehovah Raha, R-A-A-H. I love this one, the Lord our shepherd, or you could say the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Raha, the Lord, our shepherd. What is the shepherd? When you look at it, he's one that feeds you, he's one that protects you, and he's one that leads you. He is my great shepherd. I'm an under-shepherd, so I, I, I'm an under-shepherd, but he is the great shepherd. So we always look to him. My job as an under-shepherd is to do what? Feed, protect, and lead. How do I do that? By pointing all of you to him. Because I can't feed you unless he anoints me, unless he does it. And I can't feed you, even with the anointing, you can't be fed unless you want to be fed. Right? You, you can't be led unless you want to be led. Does that make sense? So he's the great shepherd. He's our shepherd. Jehovah, the next one is Jireh. J-I-R-E-H. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord, our provider. Not only is he a shepherd, not only does he feed and protect and guide us, but he, now he's Jehovah Jireh. He's our provider. But this, this word gives a picture of how he provides. It, the Bible, Jireh means he sees ahead and provides. Right? We see this when Abraham, it's, he's only called Jehovah Jireh one time in the Old Testament on Mount Moriah when Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. That ram, while Abraham was obeying God, moving towards Mount Moriah, three-day journey, there was a ram going there too. God sees ahead. As you're sitting here right now, God has already seen ahead. He's already working behind the scenes in your life to bring everything to pass that you'll need for the rest of your life. That's just amazing to me. The next one is what we're specifically talking about in these sessions. Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord, our healer. Amen? Rapha. R-A-P-H-A. The next one. I love this one, Jehovah Nisi. We used to sing a song in the 80s, a worship song that had different, and Jehovah Nisi, you guys, you old timers, right? We, we kind of remember that. Jehovah Nisi, which means our banner, really what it means is our victory. Jehovah is our victory. So if I have Jehovah, I have the victory. Do you see that? If I have Jehovah, I have healing. If I have Jehovah, I have provision. I have a great shepherd. I have somebody who's leading me, guiding me, protecting me, feeding me. Do you see that? This is so, so very important. The next one, Jehovah Shammah. S-H-A-M-M-A. Jehovah Shammah. It literally means the Lord is present. The definition is our ever, the Lord is our ever-present help 
in time of need. Our ever-present help. See, with God, it's not like he's on his way, ever. You get in trouble, he's not on his way, he's there. Isn't that cool? Yeah. He's already there. See, if you really study out the angel of the Lord and camps round about those to deliver them. I, God knows. The next, the next battle I'm going to be in, God already knows. There's already a campsite for those angels. And when I get there, they're there. They're not coming. They'll never, it's impossible for God to be late because he is Jehovah Shammah. He is my ever-present help in my time of need. He even says, before you ask, before you call, I'll answer. That's how good God is. The next one is so important. Je Jehovah Shalom. The Lord our peace. The Lord our peace. And as you see, like as an example here, the only way to lay hold of and act on the peace of God is to do what? You have to act on your redemptive rights. I can't, unless I, unless I literally put the word of God first and, and, I, and I incline my ear to it, I give it my undivided attention, I keep it in the midst of my heart. Why? I'm meditating in it day and night because now I'm going to be in a position where I act on my redemptive rights so that I could experience his peace, so that I can experience his victory, so that I could experience in my life, healing power from God, restoring my body, so that I could experience being fed by him, being protected by him, being led and guided by him. I, I had glimpses of this just in high school. Man, baby Christian, didn't know anything. I've seen God help me in basketball games. There were, there were times... And it, and it was very rare, but it was only because I, I positioned myself. I didn't even know this back then. But I look back, and there were times when I knew what was going to happen before it happened. And, and there was no way I could have known it. There were times when I would do things, and all of a sudden, it, it, would, it was just it violated everything that I knew to do as a basketball player, but it put me right in the right place at the right time. But in, in, in the Lord, just as... As, I, as I've grown older and got in the word, I'm seeing, I'm like, wow, God, you were in my life and I didn't even realize it. I just thought I was having a good game. I mean, it's amazing. I, 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 I've, I think back and, I, and now as a minister, I think of how it, how it feels sometimes when I minister. And I'm like, when I was 16 years old, I felt that. Are you kidding me? So, so God would anoint you to shoot a basketball? Yeah. He wants to help you in every way. It's wonderful. He's the Lord our peace. But for me to walk in the peace of God, and here it is, the peace of God is not of this world. It mounts guard over your heart and your mind. So while all hell is breaking loose around you or in your body, you're at peace and you know I already have the victory. I already have the provision. I have everything I need because I have him. The last one, Jehovah Sidkenu. I'm not going to spell that one because I'm sure that one's so easy you guys could figure that one out, right? <laughs> Jehovah Sidkenu, it's T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U. I'll spell that again. T S I D. K-E-N-U. Now, I love this one. It's the Lord, our righteousness. Remember how it says in 2 Corinthians 5? Jesus was made to be sin so that I would be made the righteousness of God. Not clothed in it, made it. Jehovah is my righteousness. So how I walk in that is I've got to walk in and activate that by believing his word and keeping it ever before me. Otherwise, I'll be the righteousness of God 
walking in defeat when I don't have to. Right? Because, see, we can't be defeated. We have to literally choose it because we've already been given the victory. Righteousness, that's our position with our Heavenly Father. But when we have Him, we have righteousness. Do you see that? It's wonderful. Now in the New Testament, if you'll notice, there is no Jehovah anything, is there? So you're like, well, what, what's up? Why do you not see these Jehovah, these redemptive names of God in the New Testament? But actually, you see them all over. How I say all of them is this, Jesus. If I have Jesus, I have the great shepherd. Right? If I have Jesus, I have the victory. I have peace. I have provision. I have all of these things. I have, I have just peace beyond all understanding in my life. I have healing because I have Jesus. Do you see how there's no possible way that God is not a healer? There's just no possible way. So you can believe that. So yes, you know, go to a doctor. Listen, do these things under the context of putting all of your trust in the Lord. Because guess who could help a doctor figure out what the deal is? You might be having all kinds of problems, right? And you don't know what's going on. Man, you know, do, do I have dyslexia? Do I have this? Do I have that? Or I'm dizzy all the time. What's going on in my body? Maybe I have Alzheimer's or dementia. And then you go to Andy and he adjusts your neck and it, it fixes a blockage. And now all of a sudden you don't have that anymore. It could be as simple as that. You don't know. But with God, it doesn't matter because nothing is too big for him. So whether you need an adjustment, whether you need some more of a vitamin, or whether you need God to give you a brand new heart, is any, I mean, everything changed in Abraham's life when God said to him, Abram, is anything too hard for me? He said that to Moses, kind of, didn't he? I am that I am. Nothing's too hard for me, Moses. I'll be everything you'll ever need me to be. What do you need him to be? Because you might be sitting here going, okay, for 40 years I've, I've just lived my own life and I've really messed everything up. God calls that no big deal. He's like, no, no, I can handle that. I got that. I could help you. Doesn't matter where you're at. He can relate and move you into where you need to be. I just love that. So now let's go to Exodus 23. Exodus 23, verse 25. Oh, I'm so excited about getting into some principles of laying hold of your healing. But I hope that in these last nine weeks, you're learning how to lay hold of your healer. Because I got to tell you, that's 99% of it. When you get up in the morning and you know, I'll never face anything today. I'll never face anything in my life that's bigger than my God. And he loves me and he's with me. He's my protector. He feeds me. He leads me. He guides me. He anoints me. All of these things. Jesus is here right now. It says in Mark 16 that he's here. He's working with and confirming his word with signs following. He wants his word working in your life so that you're like a living sign. You're walking around as a sign of what God's doing in the earth. He's my healer. He's my provider. So Exodus 23, verse 25. I love this verse. It says this. And we, we say this a lot. Usually we, we confess this scripture before we eat. Lord, I thank you for blessing my bread and water. You know, then, then when you grow spiritually, you realize, well, you know, he blesses more than my bread and water. That's symbolic. So... Lord, I thank you that you bless my food and take sickness from my midst. It's a great thing to pray over your meal. But there's so much more here. It says in verse 25, And you shall serve the Lord your God. This word serve 
is the word, the Hebrew word for worship. You're saying, well, gosh, why would they, why would they say serve then? How, how do you serve God? Well, I serve God by ushering. I serve God as I provide for my family at work. I serve God just in many, many different ways. Yeah, and they're all to be worship. Everything. I got to tell you, when you see people in church and, and worship's going on in a corporate setting and there's, and there's, there's magnified help to get people in line to worship and somebody is just sitting there and they're not worshiping. I love that I sit in the front row because people might think, like I've been told I need to walk around during worship and see where everybody's at in the church. (laughs) But how could I adequately pastor, how could I adequately minister the word if I'm not worshiping? Because every time, you, every time you serve God, or another way to say that is every time you worship God, you put yourself in a position for him to bless whatever you're doing. So I got to tell you, I would encourage you, have times throughout your day where you just lift your hand and thank the Lord. Now, if you're driving, just lift one hand, <laughs> right? Unless you're at a stoplight. But I, I mean, literally... Worship. They shall serve, and you shall serve or worship the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and water, and will take sickness away from the midst of thee. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in thy land, and the number, or the number of thy days, God says, I will fulfill. I want to fulfill the number of my days. Right? I want to live until I've yielded all my fruit in my season. Now, does that mean I have a set day to die? No, you know, I've wasted some time. So I've got some things to catch up on. So I'm so thankful there's things I could do to lengthen my days, to lengthen my life. Right? See, now, well, now I'm 56 years old, so, you know, my mom can tell me to do something and, and I could keep the word of God. I don't have to obey her anymore, right? But I do have to honor her if I want to live long on the earth. When will I ever stop honoring my mom? Never. Notice it doesn't say honor and obey your parents if they deserve it. And all of us parents say, thank God, right? Because how many, you know, we mess up has nothing to do with it, right? So this is so very, very important. The number of your days, God wants you, he wants you fruitful. He doesn't want you barren. He he doesn't want anything casting its fruit, whether it be a child, whether it be anything early. He wants to bless you. And if the enemy has stolen from you in this area, everything has to come back in this life. So start this process. I love this. God said, I will bless your food and take sickness from you. In other words, eat and healing will come. What is this talking about? This is all, in the book of Exodus, it's all pointing back to Passover. He's saying here, even in the 23rd chapter, eat and your healing will come. Eat what? He's talking about they ate the Passover lamb. So now to a New Testament believer, you eat Jesus. How do I do that? Have you ever heard somebody preaching saying meditating in the word is like a cow chewing their cud? They chew chew food, they swallow it, and then they bring it right back up in their mouth and they chew it some more. Right? Eat the word of God. Meditate on it day and night and healing will be yours. Why? Because you'll act on your redemptive right. And you'll say, hold on, wait a minute. I'm a child of God. I'm a citizen of heaven. 
I've been redeemed from the curse of poverty and lack. I've been redeemed from sickness and disease. The blessing of Abraham is upon my life. I live in an eternal jubilee. So debts, you got to be canceled. you got to go. Finances, you got to come. Healing is mine. Do you see that? And every bit of that, it makes you a light in this world. So that, you know, we sit here and talk about, oh, receive Jesus. I can't wait till people are, are, are like, man, why did you come? Because everybody I meet from this church gets healed. Everybody, I mean, people, I know friends who came here with nothing, and now they got thriving businesses, and they're blessed, and this and that. Great. You're like, well, wait a minute. What, you know, the people could get materialistic. You know what's really funny about that? When you walk with God, you are so far away from materialism. It's, it's just amazing. It, 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 you really enjoy this beautiful automobile that you have. You know, you move from a car to an automobile, right? But, but you can give it away in a moment of time because it doesn't mean anything to you. You enjoy it before, without God first, you're striving to get this pastoral 7 Series BMW that just is... You know, I mean, God would might even enjoy driving that. Maybe, I don't know. And you put your whole identity in it. And then you get it and you sit in there. And it smells so nice and looks and it's so comfortable. And yet, you still feel this big void in you. That's so, see, that's, that's the way the world is. But you can go out and get in your 73 1973 brown maverick with a three on the tree shifter where you, you know, you can't even put your basketball in the trunk because it would roll out because there's such a big hole of rust in it, right? You don't, you don't ever want to stomp your feet on the bottom of your car because you know it's moving and you know, man, that could break through at any moment and you don't want to be Fred Flitstone. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, see, I, I, or, or you have like I have. I had this car. My parents had this Honda Civic wagon. It was bright orange, okay? And I, I had no money at one time and not, nothing. I needed a car. It had been sitting in Pismo Beach, which is by the ocean, salt water. The whole thing's rusted out, you know, and it had an oil leak. So... When I'd start the car, I'd say from that wall to about here, from this wall to that wall would be this massive white cloud <laughs> of oil burning. My friend called it the space shuttle. He was in college studying to be a movie director. He made a movie of my car. <laughs> Tony's Wild Flight. It had me taken off and blown up. It was ridiculous. But you know what? That car, even though I, I blew some holes in it because I, I got too close to the rust when I was cleaning it, it, it was clean. And I thank God for that car. But you know, I didn't drive that car very long. That was one of the cars, well, th there was two cars that I owned that I couldn't give away. That was that Maverick and that, that Civic. I just, I couldn't give them away because I wouldn't do that to anybody. But they were clean. But you live a life thankful. I can tell you this, when I was driving those cars, I was so happy because I, was, I knew who I was in Christ. And I was content on the way to where I'm going. That's what I'm saying here. Why do I say that? Because when you're, when, you're, when you're in a situation, whether it's healing, finances, whatever it is, you can get frustrated and you will get frustrated if you take your eyes off the Lord and get your eyes on yourself or your circumstances. So this is huge. If you follow him and obey him, he takes sickness from you. Now let's jump over to Psalm 105. Psalm 105, and we're going to look at verse 37. You guys doing okay this evening? I hope, I hope when you come to church, I hope you're like me. I mean, as soon as this service is over, I'm going to be looking forward to Sunday. You know, it's like, man, I just... I just I just love, I've, I've been like that for decades now, coming to church. I just loved it. In, in, in our church in California, we would have church Sunday morning, and then we'd have church Sunday night, and then Wednesday night. 
And man, Sunday morning, I'd be looking forward, to eating lunch, looking forward to Sunday night. Because I'd sit there and just revelation, revelation. I mean, all this stuff. And what's really cool, then you learn in your own life that what you learn here just sets the stage so you walk in this even in greater measure outside of here because now you're applying it. Psalm 105, 37. Look at, look at what it says here, talking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, which is a type of the church of us coming out of the world and being saved. After they ate the Passover lamb, look at what it says about them. He brought them forth also with silver and gold, and there was not one feeble, this word in the Hebrew language means sickly, among their tribes. This word sickly can even be, this means there was no missing parts on anybody. They were slaves. So after eating the Passover lamb, you talk about a healing revival that broke out in all those individual houses as they ate the Passover lamb. I'm telling you, guys, the healer is in us. The healer's not only in us, but he's watching over us. And he never lies and he never changes. So now you're in Psalm. Go back to Psalm 103. So it says here in verse 1 of Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. This is where me, the spirit man Tony, is saying, Soul, we are going to bless the Lord. With everything that is within me, I'm going to bless him. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities. I'm so glad that everything that could produce death, because the wages of sin is death, all, he, all of my iniquities are forgiven. Everything that, that Satan could use to produce death in my life has been removed. Who what? Healeth all thy diseases. Now this is interesting because the word healeth is the word rapha. 67 times in the Old Testament, it always means physical healing. All thy diseases, it's the Hebrew word nosos, N-O-S-O-S. It always denotes, always denotes physical diseases and sicknesses. Always. Who redeems, who redeems thy life from destruction. And this Along with this first five verses, it's all in the, it's like a present participle. It literally, in the Hebrew language, you can't tell the difference again. It's literally what God has always done, what he's doing now, and what he always will do. He's constantly, he's continuous. It's talking about his continuing redeeming action. He redeemed you. He is redeeming you, and he always will. It's continuous. Isn't that good news? I love this. He who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies thy mouth with good things, he will give you what to say so that your youth will be renewed like the eagles. If Satan can shut you up, I'm telling you, he's got you. The Bible says, let the redeemed say so. Because this is how our youth is renewed. Are you ever bummed out? Are you ever depressed? Change it. Well, I fight depression. Stop it. Fighting depression will wear you out and you'll lose. You take the word of God and you get it in your heart so it's in such abundance that it's constantly coming out of your mouth and pretty soon you're going to wake up and go, where is depression? Because your youth will have been renewed like the eagles. Oh, if there's a chemical imbalance, guess what? He healeth. He'll take care of that, right? Right? but then he'll make it so that you'll never face this again. Literal meaning of verses 4 and 5, I, I broke down the Hebrew, this is exactly what it would say. The one redeeming thee from destruction and decay, 
the one crowning thee with compassion, the one satisfying thee. Isn't that, isn't that good news? Wow. See, in the, in the Septuagint, which was, we went through that last week, Remember the, the, the Bible of Jesus' day, the Old Testament translated into Greek. In the Septuagint, in the Greek language in this Septuagint, it literally denotes that this is what God is right now doing. Right now. So 10 minutes from now, right now he's doing it. And, and five minutes from now, he's right now doing it. This is who, see, do you see, it's, it's not just what he does, it's, it's who he is. God is the one keeping our hearts beating right now. He's the one. He's the one keeping your heart beating. Doesn't Acts 17, 28 say, it is in him that I live, that I move, that I have my being. This is spiritually, emotionally, physically, he is my everything. He didn't just redeem you spiritually. He redeemed you spirit, soul, and body. Now, we have the first fruits now, but I'm telling you, healing's for us now during this time before we get our glorified bodies. I love that. God, what am I saying? He is the source. You notice how the Lord said this to me, and I say this almost every time I take an offering. God is your source of finances. He is your source of healing. He's your source of provision. If you have him, you have it all. And here's the thing, you have it all. So stop trying to look at the natural. You already have it. Get this, because this is truth. It's the greatest thing in the world. It changes facts. It'll change everything in your life. God will see to it because he's not a man that he would lie. So now let's jump over real quick. We're kind of coming down the mountain a little bit here, but go to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. We always quote verse 20, he sent his word and healeth them. But I want to back up and I want to get this in context. Start at Psalm 107 and we're going to start in verse 17 so that I could give you a bigger picture of this. Man, I'm telling you, what's hard about this is as I'm preaching, this is getting so big in me. That it is just like, God, I, you know, and in my natural mind, I'm seeing, well, we got to move forward. And we actually are, but it, it's just so big. I wish we had four or five hours to get into this. But we do. We just have them on different days, right? So that's all good. Look at this, Psalm 107, 17. It says, now, the whole picture, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. So let's not be foolish. It says because of their transgressions and iniquities, that's what, what God is saying is there's things that you can do in your life. There's things in your lifestyle that can open the door for the enemy to come steal, kill, and destroy. So don't do that. It says that this fool, look at verse 18, their soul abhorreth all manner of meat. Now in context, this is talking about the fool leaves the word. They abhor all manner of meat. That meat that it's talking about is the word. A fool opens the door by actions in their life that are contrary to God's word, and it brings affliction in their life. And then it says, but really, now we're going a little deeper. Why would they do that? Because they're, they're saying, I don't want any of this meat. I, I'm, I'm abhorring. I'm disliking. I'm not respecting the word of God. And what happens when you put this on the shelf, and it's no longer first, this is what happens it draws you near unto the gates of death. Do you think your path is close to the gates of death? No. God doesn't want you to go there. So see, here's the thing. Remember, in Christ, there's no guilt, shame, or condemnation. 
Have you ever been minding your own business? You're reading the word and all of a sudden, the word chastises you. And all of a sudden it's revealed, whoa, I thought I was really doing good. And now the Holy Spirit's saying, Tony, this area of your life, I want you to give it to me. I'm telling you, do you feel condemned? No. You're just like, God, you love me so much, you're helping me. It says in verse 19, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saves them out of their distresses. Do you notice that? First of all, it starts out with the fool. Now, I don't know about you, but in my Bible, I really could write my name Tony above that word. Because have you ever been a fool? Have you ever decided to walk in transgression and iniquities? Right? But God's saying, if you're a fool and you choose sin and you live your life, ah, I'm not going to go to church today. I'm not going to read my Bible. I'm just going to live my life. But what happens, and they draw, it, it takes them right near to the gates of death. Here is the good news. Then they cry to the Lord in their trouble. This is a person that brought the trouble on themselves. Can any of you be like me and go, amen, I've, I've, most of the trouble in my life I've brought on myself. But when I cried to the Lord in my trouble, he saved me out of all my distresses. Do you see? He's good. He's gracious. He's not wanting to slap you. He wants you to live. And when you realize that, Oh, will that cause you to walk holy before him? Because you just want to please him. You just want to love him because you got a revelation. He just loves me so much. Now, in all of this, how did he, when we cried to him in our trouble, how did he save me out of all my distresses? How did he save me? I was an alcoholic my whole life and now my liver's almost gone, my kidneys are messed up and I, or I was a drug addict and my mind is blown and my organs are a mess. Whatever it is, but I called to the Lord in my distresses and he saved me. Well, how? I'm so glad you asked. Verse 20. He sent his word and healed them. You see how you got to see it in context? Notice it doesn't say the wonderful people who live perfectly, who just live for the word of God every day of their life. No, this is, t of course, they walk in the blessing. It's already told us that. But if you get to the point where you have messed up, it is never too late because if you call on the Lord, he will send his word and deliver you from their destructions. Wow. There's a specific, I'm going to close with this, there's a specific manner in which healing comes to you and I. It comes through the Word of God. Amen. Jesus is the living Word. The Bible is the written Word. Boy, when you meditate in the written Word, and then you rhema, you speak it, the spoken word. It brings the living word, the power right on the scene. So in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, healing from Genesis to maps comes through the word. Why are you saying that so many times? It doesn't come by what you do. It comes by the word. Don't get in a works mentality. You just, you just, you call upon the Lord, you speak his word, and you let him do the work. Right? Does that make sense? Yes. If you do what I say and keep my word, then God says I'm able to take sickness from you. Be a doer of the word of God, and God will take sickness from you. Does that make sense? So we'll go on with this, but uh, this has been good, hasn't it? Amen. God's a healer. God wants to use you to lay hands on the sick. It says that they that believe in my name will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's Mark chapter 16. Amen. Let me pray for you, Father.